Lyme disease is currently the number one vector-borne infectious disease in the U.S. It's growing at upwards of hundreds of thousands of cases per year, and unfortunately for many, it goes undiagnosed. In this two-part podcast series, I'm going to be interviewing a Lyme disease expert, Dr. Darren Ingalls, on navigating Lyme disease and many of the other aspects of infection, diagnosis, and the biggest question, treatment. I wanted to start at part one, uh, one with Ryan's story. So Ryan was actually diagnosed when he was younger with, he was one of the few, for, first cases in Washington state to be diagnosed. And so I just have a short little snippet here where he's going to share his experience with Lyme disease. And then uh, we'll get into the interview with Dr. Darren Ingalls. Uh, He's been so kind as to allow us to use uh, the PowerPoint that he used at the, our national convention, which is where I interviewed him in Arizona as some of it, especially when getting into treatments is super complex and getting into herbs and, and, uh, different treatment plans that really you need to find a physician who does these things to work with you. Trying to self-diagnose and then self-treat is very, very difficult, especially with something with Lyme disease, co-infections, and some of the autoimmune conditions that uh, come out of Lyme disease. So in part two, we will be addressing a lot of treatment, but I've made it so that it's not so confusing for you. You can find the show notes for this podcast, as well as the PowerPoint that Dr. Ingalls has offered at huntharvesthealth.com slash podcast slash Lyme disease one. I don't even know how old I was when I got it. Um, I think I was like the eighth case or something in Washington is what they said. It was, it was new. Now I remember I had read like a small article. I think it was like Outdoor Life or Field and Stream or something like that. Back then, I spent way too many days in the turkey woods um, down in uh, kind of mid to southern Washington, down in the oak trees and there were acorns everywhere, a lot of ticks. And down there, you know, you're just picking ticks off all day long. And, and uh, yeah, I got, you know, you get latched onto every once in a while. So I got bit, and one of the ones got in me, apparently, and it got, um, I was down there for a long time, and apparently my tick checks didn't work, because uh, it got in there, and, <clears throat> and I ended up, <clears throat> back then, I just dug it out, you know, hmm. just kind of dug it out, try to get all the little pieces out, you know, when you just pull them off, and the, they break, back before I knew how to, how to get them out, right? Um, they leave little pieces in there, so just take a knife and just kind of try to root around the head, get it out. But yeah, shoot, it wasn't that long, and um, ended up getting uh, showing signs with that little bullseye on on where I got bit, and it, um, you know, just because my folks had kind of been aware of it through that article, we went in and got checked, and sure enough, I had it, and so. Yeah, back then it was easy because I caught it so fast. Mm-hmm. Went in and it was a simple, you know, bout of antibiotics because I caught it quick and and it got detected and got rid of it. So lucky for me. Dr. Darren Ingalls received his Bachelor of Science degree in medical technology from Purdue University and his doctorate in naturopathic medicine from Bastyr University in Seattle. Dr. Ingalls completed a residency program at the Bastyr Center for Natural Health, and prior to attending medical school, he worked as a clinical microbiologist and immunologist at Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois. Dr. Ingalls is a licensed naturopathic physician in the state of Connecticut and a licensed doctor of naturopathic medicine in the state of California, where he maintains practices in both states. He is both He is board certified in integrated pediatrics by the American Association of Integrative Medicine. Dr. Ingalls is a member of the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, the American Association of Integrative Medicine, the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, or ILADS, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, and many state organizations. Dr. Ingalls is currently a board member of the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians. He is the author of the upcoming book on Lyme disease, The Lyme Solution, a five-part plan to fight the inflammatory autoimmune response and beat Lyme disease. 
which will cover an integrative and natural approach to the treatment and management of Lyme disease. Dr. Ingalls' practice fo focuses on environmental medicine with special emphasis on chronic immune dysfunction, including Lyme disease, autism, allergies, asthma, pandas, recurrent or persistent infections, and other genetic or acquired immune problems. His practice is compromised of both children and adults, and he uses diet, nutrient, herbs, homeopathy, and immunotherapy to help his patients achieve better health. Hi, Darren. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, hi, Hillary. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I went to your lecture yesterday on, uh, on Lyme disease and some of the autoimmune components and some of the treatments that you're using in your clinic. And I found it very exciting. And um, I just, I would love for you to share with us, you know, your knowledge today in all aspects. I have so many questions that we'll try to get some of them answered. But I, can you just give us a little bit of background on yourself and, and why you're in this profession and, and what is it about Lyme disease? you like working with Lyme disease? Sure. Well, I uh, actually got started. Uh, my undergraduate degree is actually in medical technology. So I worked in a large teaching hospital outside of Chicago doing microbiology and immunology. Uh, and so med techs were basically the people when you get a blood sample, urine sample, stool sample, you send it to us and we're the guys who actually run the tests. Mm -hmm. So they call it technically clinical pathology. And so I had a broad background in microbiology and immunology before I went to medical school. And uh, some personal experiences uh, during that time, uh, I, I knew some people who had had some chronic health issues that really weren't being addressed through conventional medicine. And at the time, I was applying to be a conventional medical doctor because I didn't know anything else. And it was actually through some other types of healing modalities like cranial sacral therapy and acupuncture that I saw people really start to change in ways that conventional medicine wasn't addressing. Uh, and actually, it was an acupuncturist I knew who told me about Bastyr, naturopathic medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of looked into it, and I, it really just resonated with me that uh, this sounded like a pass, so I applied to naturopathic school and ended up going to Bastyr. And then once I started my clinical practice, uh, I started studying a lot of environmental medicine, which is looking at all these external factors in your life that influence health, you know, the chemicals you're exposed to, the food you're eating, and things of that nature. Uh, and then I contracted Lyme disease in 2002. So there's nothing like a little personal experience to right. uh, educate you very quickly. And uh, I, you know, I had very classic Lyme disease with the bullseye rash, headache, fatigue, joint pain, and so forth. And I, I did the standard treatment like everybody does. And, you know, after four days of doxycycline, I felt great for about eight months. Mm. <laughs> and then I had just opened my practice. I was, you know, doing everything, working 12-hour days. And uh, I think the stress kind of caught up with me and I started becoming symptomatic again. And when I went back on antibiotics, it didn't help. And I continued down that path like a lot of people do of, you know, numerous antibiotics, different combinations. And I got sicker and sicker and got to a point where really I felt like a chemo patient. You know, very nauseous, had no appetite and just really felt unwell. And I was very fortunate to come across uh, a doctor in New York uh, who had been treating Lyme disease using traditional Chinese medicine. And so I went to see him and I'd had a few patients who had seen him and had good success. And uh, through his therapies, really kind of pulled me out of the weeds and got my health back. And from there, I just started using other types of, you know, more really you know, naturopathic therapies, uh, you know, looking at my diet, looking at herbs I was taking, trying to get better sleep and really controlling my lifestyle to get my health back. And it, it, it took a while, but you know, we eventually got to that point. Right. Uh, well, I think the personal story, you know, kind of brings it home for people, especially when you've suffered with something like this. And then you, you've been like, a lot of the um, interaction we got on this question was really around the treatments and how they're not working or how long do you need to take it and how people thought they could do it and then be fine. And then they have a resurgence of symptoms. And so it's, I think it's important sometimes as a healthcare provider to actually be able to, uh, to meet your patients and be like, yeah, you know, I know what you're going through. I've been here. And um, sometimes practitioners can't do that. And I think that I feel like Lyme disease is really becoming an epidemic, um, at least in North America. Maybe you can give us a little, maybe what we should do, because there's so much on this topic, is kind of go like from the beginning first. And yeah. what I'd like you to share to start with is, you know, um, Really, what is the history of Lyme? What, what are we talking about here when we say Lyme disease? Yeah, so Lyme disease itself is actually a bacterial infection. It's a 
created by an organism called Borrelia, and there are many species of Borrelia that can cause Lyme disease. Uh, the history of sort of modern Lyme disease, uh, there was a cluster of children in Lyme, Connecticut, that's where it's named from, uh, that developed uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a somewhat rare condition to see in children. It's an autoimmune condition where they get a lot of, you know, joint pain and inflammation. And so they just found it very odd that this, you know, large cluster of children were having these symptoms in this area. And as they started to investigate it, uh, they felt that there was some infectious component to it. So they ended up sending samples to a doctor in uh, Colorado, his name was Willie Bergdorfer, and he had been studying a different condition called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and they thought it might have been that illness. And so as he started investigating it, it took him about a year, uh, he finally identified this, this spirochetal illness. And uh, of course, when you're the guy who finds it, you get to name it after yourself. Right. So that's why it's Borrelia <laughs> Bergdorferi, named after Willie Bergdorfer. And uh, so that was discovered back in 1984. And that's when he really uh, first, uh, I think, published uh, the paper on that. So uh, it, when they started to realize that, you know, Lyme was causing all these other kind of symptoms, uh, you know, that's where, where Lyme disease, you know, picked up its name. But what's really interesting is historically, we, uh, there's a, an ice man they found in Austria. Uh, they call him Otzi the Iceman. Mm -hmm. uh, he's over 5,000 years old. And they actually did take a DNA sample from the Iceman, and they found DNA of Borrelia in his blood. So wow. this really isn't a new organism. Uh, it's been around for thousands of years. I think the bigger question is why is it a problem now than it was perhaps 5,000 years ago? I mean, I can remember as a kid, I mean, I grew up all over the country and being out with my siblings and playing in the fields and, you know, we would find ticks quite often. And I don't ever remember anybody getting any Lyme related kind of illness. So I think something has shifted over the course of the last, you know, few decades that seems to be in some way sensitizing us to the effects of Lyme disease or this Borrelia organism that we didn't see before. And actually the World Health Organization actually published a paper that suggests that climate change is really uh, what explains why we're seeing more tick-borne problems, not just Lyme disease, but other uh, diseases that are transmitted by ticks and mosquitoes and fleas and, and things of that nature. Okay. So I, I think that explains part of it. But there's another part of, you know, microbes. And, and speaking as a microbiologist, you know, if you go back historically, we can see that, you know, bugs change over time. You know, there was a time where the plague, uh, tuberculosis, you know, wiped out a third of the world. They were very virulent, which means that it was very easy to make people sick. And a lot of people died from these infections. And nowadays, you know, we don't hear about the plague we don't hear about tuberculosis. No, there's never been a vaccine for these, so we can't say it's been vaccination. So it's just the nature that these organisms mutate, they change. Sometimes they become make you more sick, and other times they become more benign. So it may be that the Borrelia organism has mutated in a way that it's now become more virulent or more problematic. But you know, we really don't know for sure. And I, I remember you saying in your talk yesterday that we are only able to isolate how many um, of the Borrelia, but there's actually like, yeah. hundreds. Yeah, so of different uh, types. you know, Borrelia burgdorferi was the first strain that we identified back in the early 80s. Uh, we now know, at least in the United States, that most of the East Coast cases are Borrelia burgdorferi. Out on the West Coast of the United States, about half of the cases are Borrelia miyamotai. So we know there's at least 100 strains in the US and about 300 strains worldwide. We have the ability to test for about six or seven of them. Oh, dear. So one of the big problems we're running into in identifying Lyme is just good testing. And we have a lot of deficits in the testing that's available. And I think this is why it becomes very confusing for people uh, and, and doctors as well, of trying to figure out whether this is what's causing people's health problems. Right. So when you talk about the West Coast versus the East Coast, um, are those different ticks or can you maybe just... Can you maybe talk about the tick itself that is transmitting? Sure. The tick itself that's been identified in transmitting Lyme disease is called the Ixodes tick. It's a deer tick. Right. There are different species of the deer tick. So out on the East Coast, it's called Ixodes scapularis. And on the West Coast, it's Ixodes pacificus. Um, that's sort of generic. Uh, but, you know, the Ixodes species are the ones. And if you go into Europe and other parts of the world, there are other species of Ixodes ticks that can also transmit Lyme. So I think it's kind of interesting, though, when you look worldwide, is that the tick that transmit it is different and the strain of Borrelia is different. So it just kind of speaks to the complexity of this illness is that we're 
we're dealing with a lot of different, you know, uh, subspecies of Borrelia that's causing this problem. But, you know, if you look at the, uh, for me, when I look at Ixodes scapularis, Ixodes uh, pacificus, they look the same to me. So The tick actually the, looks the same? Yeah, the deer tick still looks like the deer tick. Okay. Uh, so, at least for me. Looking, what does the I've deer already, tick look like? So, the deer tick... Uh, so I guess I should backtrack just to yeah. sort of talk a little bit more about ticks so yeah. that people understand, you know, if you're an outdoors person, if you're hunting, camping, doing these kind of things, you know, the most common tick that people actually tend to pick up are uh, wood ticks or dog ticks. So a lot of times people say, oh my gosh, I pulled a tick off myself and, you know, they get worried about Lyme disease. So I think if you're an outdoors person, it's really important that you familiarize yourself with what these ticks look like because they do look very distinct from one another. Okay. And sometimes you can just save yourself a little bit of grief of kind of knowing what kind of tick, you know, you might be pulling off yourself. Right. Uh, but uh, the deer tick itself is a little bit smaller than the wood tick and the dog tick and the body shape is different so the deer tick has more of a teardrop shaped body uh, where the wood tick and the dog tick has a little bit more of a round body to it okay and again it's a little hard to describe on a podcast but i think if you go online and you start to look at these you, it'll become very clear there also are some coloration differences in between a deer tick a dog tick and a wood tick okay um, and you know in terms of the type of things that each tick transmits is different as well. So the deer tick is the one we most associate with Lyme disease. Okay. There is uh, another tick called the Lone Star tick that we find mostly throughout the Southeast United States, you know, Texas and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, where it transmits a different strain of Borrelia that causes a disease, disease called Starry. Uh, Starry is basically Lyme disease light. Uh, so you get a lot of the Lyme symptoms, but it's very treatable with antibiotics. It goes away very, very quickly. Okay. Um, so it's a, a little bit of a different condition. But you know, some of these other ticks, like wood ticks and dog ticks, although they're not as known as associative treating, uh, trans, excuse me, transmitting Lyme, they can transmit other types of infections. So it can transmit uh, a condition called tularemia, Colorado tick fever, of course, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Most of those ticks are able to transmit that. So there's a lot of other bacterial and even viral infections that can be transmitted through these ticks as well. Okay. And so are those kind of like the co-infections that we talk about? Um, does the deer tick also give you co-infections or is it, it does. pretty straightforward Lyme? It does, yeah. So when someone comes in, if we're concerned that they have Lyme disease, you know, we're not just testing for Lyme. We're always testing for co-infections. Clinically, it can be very difficult to distinguish what's Lyme versus some of the other ones. So some of the more common co-infections, uh, one's called Babesia. Mm -hmm. Babesia is a cousin of malaria. It's actually a blood parasite. And so you can almost get malaria kind of symptoms with, you know, cyclic fevers and uh, shortness of breath. They call it air hunger, where you feel like you just can't catch your breath. Right. That's very typical. Uh, there's another one called Bartonella. Bartonella is known to cause cat scratch fever. So you can obviously yep. get it through, you know, a cat scratching you. And usually it causes a kind of a superficial skin, skin infection. But you can get it through a tick bite, and it can again cause joint pain, headache, uh, causes a lot of numbness and tingling. That's very typical with Bartonella. And then there's other bacterial infections that are not as well known, but there's one called Ehrlichia, one called Anaplasma, there's one called Mycoplasma. And again, the, every time I go to a conference and learn more about what ticks can transmit, this list keeps getting longer and longer. Right. You know, one of the things we're seeing up in the Northeast United States now is called Powassan virus. And this is a very scary virus because it's very lethal. And we've already had a uh, few deaths in New York. And I just heard yesterday a couple of deaths in Massachusetts from Powassan virus. And because wow. viruses don't respond to antibiotics, um, you know, they're very, very difficult to treat. So this is one of the new emerging uh, tick-borne illnesses that we're very concerned about. So, yeah, I think that because we're kind of talking to a lay population here is this, that Lyme is a bacterial infection yeah. and some of these other co-infections are bacterial, but some of them are viral and that viral infections are not helped by antibiotics. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when we look at treating microbes, you know, I mean, there's bacteria, there's viruses, there's fungus, and they're all treated in very different ways. And we've all how you know historically we've had a problem as doctors treating viral illnesses because antibiotics really only work for bacteria right. they don't work for viruses and if it's a fungus we can use antifungals but we really don't have a lot of antivirals from a conventional standpoint you know in naturopathic medicine we actually do have quite a few herbs that are good antivirals but from a conventional standpoint they're very limited and a lot of the antivirals that are available really aren't very effective against some of these viruses that are transmitted through tick bites. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, again, it's, it's kind of an emerging thing that's coming out. Fortunately, there are not a lot of cases, but the concern is that it's going to grow as the tick population keeps growing. Right. Yikes. So is the Powassan, that's transmitted by the deer tick as well? It is. It is. Yeah. Wow. And what are the symptoms of that? Uh, Powassan virus uh, is you get uh, very, very high fever. Um, and it, it can basically induce almost uh, organ failure. Uh, you know, you can start to see liver problems, kidney problems. Uh, the thing with Powassan is that it moves very rapidly. You know, in some ways, it's almost kind of like meningitis. You know, wow. it can move in a matter of hours after a tick bite. People get very, very ill. Uh, and because, again, there's, we don't really know how to treat it. Um, there's not a lot medically that can be done when people get exposed. So, um, again, it's, it's a still a fairly new virus, and I don't think we really understand it the way we understand other viral illnesses. Um, but again, it's one that's definitely on everybody's radar. Right. Okay. So kind of going into the next piece of that is like, um, what is there like a time of year that's worse? Is, is there something about like summer that's worse than maybe fall or the spring or maybe the maturity of the ticks or something? I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, you know, what's the worst time to be out there? Well, the, the peak of the teak season is really between spring and fall. Um, okay. You know, once the weather starts to get colder, theoretically, uh, that starts to kill off the ticks. One of the things that we've seen, you know, certainly in recent years, is that you know, our winters just aren't getting as cold as they used to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we rely on that cold to kill off the tick population. And at least, you know, where I live in Connecticut, you know, we had a pretty warm winter. And uh, we've had a horrible, horrible tick season. And there's actually been a lot of reports around the country that ticks... Uh, the tick count's been much higher than in recent years. So definitely, you know, if we get warmer winters, instead of having that respite from being exposed to ticks, uh, you know, we're almost seeing them year round. I've now seen people, you know, in January, February developing Lyme disease and, you know, typically symptoms, you know, develop within a month of a tick bite. So you would think that's a time of year where, you know, there really aren't a lot of ticks out there, but, right. uh, you know, if it's above freezing, you know, you can have ticks out there. Right. Now, yesterday you had mentioned that they're, they are finding that there's different vectors than ticks as well. Yeah. You know, we always thought that ticks, uh, well, ticks are definitely the, the dominant vector, but, uh, we now learned that, you know, it's other biting insects that can transmit Lyme. Uh, there's been a few studies out of Europe that have demonstrated that mosquitoes can do it and even fleas. Uh, so it's not just ticks. And I think that makes sense because we see some people who get Lyme disease that live in areas where they're not really well known for having, you know, deer ticks. Um, and so that may explain part of it. Um, but, you know, it, I think it's interesting that they haven't done any research in the United States, at least that I've seen yet, that shows the mosquitoes transmit Lyme. Uh, most of that's all come out of Europe. But okay. I think it makes sense that uh, if it can do it in Europe, it can probably do it in the United States. Right. Too. So that, that opens the question, too. I get um, I've thought about this and obviously even in our world, I think there's been kind of talks or rumors about it is the whole idea of Lyme disease can be sexually transmitted. And what do you think about that? Well, you know, it's interesting because when you go into the research, uh, they haven't really demonstrated that sexual transmission happens. However, uh, my clinical observation is it seems it does because I've seen people who have, you know, known Lyme disease, uh, you know, they're having unprotected sex with their partner, and then at some point their partner develops Lyme disease as well. Mm -hmm. So um, was it sexually transmitted? Did they happen to get a tick bite they didn't know of? Um, it, you know, it's hard to say. You know, my opinion is I think it is. Uh, I, you know, that's been my observation. But if you go into the medical research, they haven't really demonstrated that. And also along that same vein, you know, there's always questions about what about you know, transmission from mom to baby? Um, yeah, we've gotten a few of those, mom yeah. to baby and during breastfeeding. Yeah. So, uh, again, the research does not demonstrate any uh, transmission from mom to baby. What they have shown though is that moms that have Lyme disease, their children have a higher risk of birth defects. So um, again, you know, as a, as a microbiologist knowing what other blood-borne pathogens like HIV and hepatitis B and hepatitis C, you know, anything where there's blood that's shared, you know, can be transmitted sexually, can be transmitted that way. So I think it makes a lot of sense that Lyme can be transmitted that way. I just don't think they've shown it in the research yet. Yeah. I mean, I, when I think of like a spirochete, I think of syphilis. Right. Right. Syphilis is a spirochete. Right. And we know that syphilis probably killed more people back in the 
the air time exactly. of the plague too <laughs> than the plague did, right? Because yeah. it was a spirochete that was sexually transmitted. And it was obviously back then they didn't have antibiotics. And even nowadays, syphilis at a certain stage, antibiotics aren't going to help it, right? Because it infects the nervous system. Right, right. And yeah, I think, you know, spirochetes share a lot of similar mechanisms. And we know with Lyme, it can invade really any tissue. So, yes, you know, again, I don't think it's rocket science to figure out that it has a good possibility of uh, being transmitted sexually or from, you know, mom to baby. Right. Okay. So, um, let's kind of go into a scenario here. Uh, let's say... So, you know, one of our listeners is out, um, you know, hiking, hunting in the late summer, early fall, um, and they're, you know, having tick exposure. So let's say that they find a tick on them. How long, um, first of all, does tick size matter like babies versus adults with transmission or... Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, we know that the, when the tick goes into its nymph stage, that's where it tends to be probably the most problematic. But the reality is, is that, you know, once a tick bites you, the longer it's attached to you, the greater likelihood if that tick carries Lyme disease or one of the co-infections has the capacity to actually infect you. You know, the CDC says that ticks need to be on generally from 24 to 48 hours to cause, uh, to infect you. But there's been other research that shows it can happen as early as 16 hours or even less. And that's for Lyme. You know, we know that some of the co-infections can actually be transmitted much faster. Mm -hmm. So uh, my feeling is, you no, know, any tick on you is potentially a problem because I don't think I've ever seen anybody who saw the tick jump on them, bite them, and then waited to see how long they stayed on. So, you know, right. people really don't know how long the tick's been on. Uh, if you get to be a little bit tick savvy, you know, you can tell the difference between a an engorged tick where there's been a blood meal and therefore the tick swells as it takes up your blood. Uh, an engorged tick will tell you that the tick's been on longer uh, versus a tick that's not engorged. So, you know, that may tell you a little bit more about how long the tick's been on you. But I think the bigger problem is that most people don't see the ticks. They don't know they were bitten, you know, but for people who are able to identify the tick, um, you know, it's very important that you remove the tick as quickly as possible. Okay. And do you, let's say people, a big question I got is, can you test the tick? You can. Can you keep the tick and test it for? Absolutely. So uh, if you are able to pull the tick out, and sometimes, you know, we want to try and, you know, get some tweezers, grab it by the head, pull it straight out. You don't want to twist it. You don't want to break the head from the body off. You don't want to put alcohol on it. You don't want to burn it. <laughs> and there's some of these old wives' tales that yeah. actually can cause the tick to actually inject its uh, saliva into you. So you just want to get some tweezers. And there's actually a company, and I forget the name, but they have tweezers with a little magnifying glass attached to it. So you can really see the tick well, grab it by the head, pull it straight out. And then if you just put it in a little Ziploc baggie and get a cotton ball, and just dampen it, put it in there that keeps the tick from drying out, seal it up. Uh, we actually send to a lab in New Jersey called Medical Diagnostic Lab. Uh, you'll probably have to work with your healthcare provider to have that done, uh, but they offer very low, low cost testing where you can test the tick for Lyme and all these co infections. And, you know, it's not 100%. But I think at least if you send it off and you find it is positive for Lyme or one of the co infections, it just gives you better, you know, impetus to start treating. Okay. So um, let's say that somebody's gotten bit and maybe it was attached for 24 to 36 or 48 hours, like you said. Um, what is the typical classical presentation? Well, the classical presentation is, you know, symptoms can develop anywhere from uh, uh, a matter of hours, really up to 30 days after the tick bite. Uh, but a classic bullseye rash where the tick bit you uh, will start to appear. The rash is very flat. It doesn't get raised. It generally doesn't get itchy. Uh, and depending on where you get bit. So when I got bit, I got bit on the back of my left leg. I couldn't see it. Uh, when I was symptomatic, you know, I had 105 fever and joint pain, and I actually thought I had meningitis. I was actually getting ready to go to the hospital, and it was in the summertime. I was changing clothes, and someone says, oh, what's that on the back of your leg? And I 
did the double mirror thing and saw the big bullseye. I'm like, oh, we can skip the hospital. I know what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you, you don't feel it. Uh, but the, the bullseye rash is the telltale sign of Lyme disease. There's no other illness that causes that. So if you see that, you know it's Lyme and you, you can start treatment right away. But in addition to that, you know, headache, joint pain, high fever, uh, I hear a lot about people feeling like their back was broken, low back pain specifically. You can get numbness and tingling in your, your hands and your feet. Uh, those are all very typical or even sometimes what's called Bell's palsy where one side of your face starts to droop because it affects mm -hmm. the nervous system. Okay. And so how many people actually present with classical symptoms? What's the percentage you think? Well, the CDC will tell you that it's somewhere about 70% or higher. Uh, in my practice, it's probably less than 20%. Um, wow. the, the skin rash, especially there's a lot of discrepancy. Again, the CDC says it's about 70% of the people who get Lyme disease will get the, uh, the bullseye rash. Uh, I rarely see the bullseye rash in people in my practice. Uh, so I, I, the studies actually suggest it's actually 40% or less. So probably not even half the people out there who get infected get the bullseye rash. So they may think they just have like a really bad flu mm -hmm. or, yep, that's very... uh, you know, a cold or like whatever, you know, and uh, they just kind of let it go. If they don't have the classic bullseye rash that's saying like, hello, yeah, exactly. <laughs> disease, right? Yeah. And, and I see a lot of gradations where, you know, people get some of the symptoms, but maybe they're not horrible. You know, I had 105 fever. Other people, maybe they get 102. You know, they feel sick, but mm -hmm. they've been sick before and they don't think it's different than any other illness they've had. Yeah, it's the cold, it's the flu. It's just some other viral infection. They're tired. Their joints are a little achy. Uh, you know, the symptoms of Lyme, because they mimic a lot of other illnesses, it's very easy to mistake it as just being something else. What are some of the, the we, I know we call it the great, great mimicker, right? Yeah. And what are some of those other diseases that we would have to rule out if we were a clinician, somebody coming in? Well, you always want to rule out other autoimmune diseases because there is a lot of, you know, symptom overlap. So, you know, we want to rule out things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we also want to rule out other neurological things like multiple sclerosis. And uh, I've seen a lot of other neurological illnesses like, you know, even Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Now, granted, they're going to present very different than just classic Lyme disease. But right. people mistake it for mono. Uh, sometimes they think it's that. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, all these kind of things can be easily mistaken. But I think it's interesting is that a lot of these conditions are really descriptions, you know, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, I mean, really what are these? You know, you can describe the symptoms, but it doesn't really explain what the cause is. And I think for a lot of people who get these, you know, sort of vague diagnoses, uh, Lyme certainly could be part of the picture. Well, just looking at the number, what is the number now of people like, let's say in North America that have Lyme disease? Well, the actual number of people, we really don't know. We know the, the CDC says it's about 30,000 new cases a year, but that, that, number is not accurate. Uh, the other research out there suggests it's actually about 300,000 people per year. And we know that it's underreported. So right. my best guess is we're probably looking at half a million or more people every year, every year. And this is the United States alone. Wow. So if you look at it worldwide, you know, we're really now talking about millions and millions of people. And you think about in medicine, right? I don't know if, how it is for you. I mean, I've only been in private practice for 10 years, but I think back like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, you weren't really hearing as much about chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and these types of conditions that also are kind of trash can diagnoses. No, they really can't find any diagnostic criteria to put you into like, oh yeah, you have MMS, you know, we saw lesions or, you know, this or that. And so they've created these diagnoses and it sounds like Lyme disease has also been slowly growing during this, <clears throat> this time. And it has like a, very similar presentations to fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, yeah. um, all these. Well, uh, there's a concept in immunology called molecular mimicry. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's interesting because what that means is that there's a molecule on a microbe that might be very similar than our own body. And whether it's your joints, your muscles, your skin. So when the immune system goes to fight the microbe, it accidentally starts fighting our own tissue. I mean, that's really the definition of autoimmunity. So if you go into the medical literature and you start, you know, looking in, you know, molecular mimicry and you type in any bug, you're going to find all these conditions come up. So I think a lot of people who get these, again, these vague diagnoses that we really can't explain, 
I think the majority of people who end up with these problems have some element of underlying infection that has triggered this immune or autoimmune problem, which is why it's hard to pinpoint because, you know, we don't necessarily have great lab testing to identify how, you know, mono or how Lyme or how any of these other organisms have really triggered this autoimmune problem because the type of antibodies they're producing are not necessarily the type of antibodies we're measuring through other lab tests. Uh, but uh, again, you know, the research is out there to show that this is the case with a lot of different conditions. Right. Okay. So, um, so besides the bullseye rash and some of these other symptoms you may see, um, somebody starts to have those. Let's say someone found a tick on them and they freak out, right? And they're like, yep. oh, what is the time between getting bit and infected to being actually able to maybe even be tested or diagnosed? I mean, should they come in right away? Should they wait a period of time for, because I know yesterday you had mentioned it takes a while for the the uh, bacteria itself to start replicating where it even shows up on a test. Like how, how does that work? Well, so, yeah, I think it's good people understand that the testing we're doing is we're not measuring the Lyme organism directly. We really don't have the good technology yet to do that. So what we're measuring is the immune response to the organism. And unfortunately, if someone gets infected, it can take up to 30 days or more to make antibodies. Hmm. So if you got bit last week and you came in today and I test you, I might be in that window where you haven't really made much of an immune response yet. So the conservative approach is if we think you've been bitten by a deer tick, we treat until proven otherwise. Okay. Before we kind of go deeper into this, yeah. just explain what an antibody is. For sure. Example. So, you know, an antibody is part of your immune system and your immune system, you can kind of simply break it down into two parts. You've got part of your immune system that has cells that are there's what are called T cells and NK cells. Mm -hmm. And these are the direct scavengers of your body. So when they see a foreign, you know, bacteria virus, they basically just eat it up, digest it and get rid of it. So they don't need any other mechanism to kind of get them to work. The other part of your immune system are what are called B cells. And B cells produce these things called antibodies. So antibodies are also called immunoglobulins. You might hear that term. Yeah. And what they do is they then coat the bacteria to help trigger another part of the immune system to do that digestive process to get rid of it. So the antibodies themselves really don't get rid of anything. All they do is help other parts of the immune system identify the foreign substance. And so when, like, if, as physicians are, you know, in the in the lab, what are the main antibodies that we're looking at? Like For, the groups, um, like IgG. And oh, yeah, that. yeah. So uh, there's actually five different classes of antibodies. Uh, the ones that we primarily look at for infection, one's called IgM and the other one's called IgG. There's really no logical reason of why we call it IgG, IgM, and so yeah. forth. But uh, <laughs> there's also IgA, IgD, and IgE. Okay. Uh, IgM is the antibody that typically is the first antibody to respond after you've been infected. And this is true for any infection, right. whether it's, you know, strep, mono, whatever. So IgM will typically go up within a matter of, again, hours to days after any infection. And then that will usually stay up for about six weeks or so. And then somewhere after that initial infection, you'll start to produce IgG antibodies. So IgG is more of your long-term antibody. Mm -hmm. And depending on what the infection is, the IgG antibodies will stay elevated for months to years after an infection. Uh, because again, that's more of your long-term antibody. So the IgM will eventually start to drop off and the IgG can stay elevated. So you could, depending on what you may see on some of the diagnostic testing, you can maybe give a little bit of reference to where they're at in the infection stage, more in the beginning or more chronic? Theoretically, yes. Theoretically, Practically, yeah. no. Right. <laughs> well, what, the, what they teach in, in, in medical school is that, you know, again, IgM is your first antibody. And so if you see an IgM that's positive and an IgG that's negative, they say, okay, well, that's a new infection. And that could be true. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you see an IgG that's positive and IgM that's negative, well, that's an old infection. That can also be true. What we know with Lyme specifically is that you can come in and out of periods of activity, and when there's activity, your IgM could start to spike again. So maybe Lyme is a little bit different than other infections, but uh, this is something we know that 
you know, you can see these elevated IGMs go up and down over the course of time. If you, you nobody does this, but I mean, if you drew someone's blood every, you know, three months, six months, year, and you measured it over time, you might see people come in and out of hmm. being IGM positive, IGM negative, and so forth. So, but from a conventional standpoint, typically when we see IGM positive, we think it's probably somewhat acute infection. And if the IGM is negative and they're only IgG positive, that may suggest that their exposure happened in the past. The reality is, is that there's really nothing we can glean from the, uh, the test itself that tells us about timing. Okay. So I think that that gets into, uh, I want to ask one thing before we start getting into actual diagnosis, sure. which gets com complicated, right? Yes. <laughs> um, is I got a lot of questions about repellents, permethrin. Yes. And why can we treat our dogs for ticks and fleas and we can't treat ourselves? Does permethrin work? Should we lather ourselves in this stuff before we go out? Like, Anything about repellents? Well, I get very concerned uh, as an environmental medicine doctor about the conventional repellents. You know, things like permethrin and DEET, uh, they're highly toxic. They do get absorbed through the skin very well. Uh, I don't think they're safe for animals either. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a vet, but uh, I would tell you what I know about what they do to the human body. I can only imagine what they do to dogs and cats. Um, you know, there's been some good evidence that actually essential oils can be very effective at repelling um, ticks. You know, my my advice is if you're going to be outdoors, particularly in areas that are known to have a lot of ticks, yeah. you know, you want to be covered almost head to toe in clothing. Long sleeve shirts, long pants, tuck your pants into your socks, shoes, uh, you know, really cover as much of that skin. It really is one of the best barriers to reduce your risk of getting a tick uh, if you can keep it on the clothing and not on your skin. Uh, beyond that, you know, I think it's very appropriate and there's several different uh, companies that make an organic uh, essential oil spray. Usually it contains, you know, a combination of lemongrass, cedar, eucalyptus, thuya, tea tree oil, you know, there's a lot of good essential oils that have really been shown to be very effective at repelling ticks, at least as well as the conventional stuff, mm -hmm. and you don't get any of the toxicity with it. Mm -hmm. So I'll have people spray their clothes, spray the areas of the skin that are exposed, be very careful around the face. Uh, you obviously, you don't want to get this in mucous membranes. It'll really burn. So, you know, yeah. don't spritz your face and get it in your eyes. Yeah. So for people, you know, you can take a little bit, put it on your hands, kind of rub it on your forehead, on your cheeks, your chin, your neck, and cover those exposed areas uh, and even you know wearing a hat to protect your scalp because that's a very common place that people can get tick bites so uh, even when it's really hot and muggy outside it's uncomfortable it is really the best way of protecting yourself against getting a tick bite yeah i loved your last slide that you had on your presentation was a uh if you can visually understand, like a doctor talking to Santa Claus sitting on her table and says, well, you have Lyme disease. Do you hang out where there's a lot of deer? And Santa's <laughs> sitting there like, huh? And I had this, like, this is like our population of people we're talking to here right. is guys that are out in the hills, you know, guys and gals out in the hills. Um, even if it's, it's not hunting, they're out there scouting, they're out there camping, they're yeah. out there doing backcountry trips. And, um, they're in these places where these animals are. And so the ticks are really thick. Um, Ryan, my husband, who um, is part of this podcast with me, yeah. <laughs> he's the hunter. I'm not. But uh, he was diagnosed with Lyme disease. He caught it early. He had the classic presentation with the bullseye rash and he did antibiotics and was able to be, he hasn't had any symptoms since then. But it seems like in this population, it's just from what I see is so many people are contracting it because they're, they're actually actively out in these areas doing it. Yeah. And so, um, I thought that little infographic you had with Santa Claus was really appropriate. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think a lot of people when they're outdoors, there's, I, I've heard this from some of my patients who are, you know, do a lot of, you know, hunting and camping and hiking and, and well, you know, do those essential oils really work? Right. They really do. You know, I think yeah. you, you, if you go into the, the research and you know, they've actually have studied this and they do find it works very, very well. But, uh, I think people really need to be cognizant of the toxicity of permethrin and DEET. Uh, they are not benign. You know, uh, the fact that they're allowed to be, you know, <laughs> put on human skin is a 
bit shocking actually when you look at the the toxicity and again for someone who's a really outdoors frequently you can imagine someone who's applying this you know two three times a week or more uh, it's a cumulative effect of this chemical on your body so you may not see it in the short term but i would definitely be concerned about some of the long-term uh, complications of these chemicals yeah for sure i think it's more advantageous to wear the clothing um do the tick check maybe even a couple times a day doing that tick check and just being really do you know due diligence about that and yep. because here's the other thing i know guys that you guys are out there hunting and the last thing you want to be spritzing yourself with is lavender oil uh and melaleuca because <laughs> deer can smell that right so yep. mostly these guys are if they're spraying themselves down it's usually with some sort of stinky deer pee thing or something i don't know um but i that, so that's where these long clothings would come in and the deer, you know, the, the, the tick checks and just making sure that you're not. Um, yeah, I exposures. mean, you know, it's it's really got to be safety first. Uh, yeah. Just I see too many people who didn't take the right precautions, got infected, didn't know. And if you're not fortunate enough to get acute Lyme that would prompt you to go to the doctor, you know, again, the long term effects of this illness can be very, you know, damaging to your life, your health. Uh, so I'd rather people really take the upfront precautions and really protect themselves. Yeah. And people who are just living in the country who are taking their dog for a walk through the woods, right? Yep. You're not thinking about it and you're picking like 50 ticks off your dog, you know, make sure you're doing a tick check on yourself. And you're, yeah. And yeah. when you're doing the tick check, you know, I mean, the places you really want to look, you know, the ticks like the dark, warm, wet areas of the body. So places where you're going to sweat a lot, you know, right. behind the knees, in the groin, in the armpit, you know, behind the ears, in the scalp, you know, those areas that, you know, are, you wouldn't necessarily think of, you know, uh, so when you're doing your own tick check, those are the areas you really want to look closely at. Yeah, that hairline is really yeah. tricky because if you have a lot of hair, you can't see back there and you may not even feel that little tick at first, right? You yeah. really need to have somebody else looking at you. <laughs> you really do. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're spending a lot of time out in the woods, uh, you know, hopefully you're with a buddy that can, uh, I mean, it might seem a little strange, but it, you know, just get used to it get and man it, up yeah. and uh, and do the tick check because, you know, you're, you're saving both of yourselves potentially a lot of grief. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So let's talk just a little bit about acute versus chronic. Um, you had given us a few of the acute symptoms yeah. and uh, a lot of people are not catching it in the acute phase. What do you say would be your percentage of patients coming in that are actually in chronic and they haven't, they didn't even know they had it? Well, in my patient population, probably 90% of the people I see are chronic. Okay. I rarely see people who are in the acute phase. And mm -hmm. I think it's just sort of the nature of where I live. You know, if people actually do have acute Lyme, uh, because I'm not a primary care doctor, right. the, more than likely they'll go to their primary care doctor to get evaluated. So the vast majority of people I'm seeing have chronic Lyme. They, they were exposed, you know, for some period. And what percent, and you don't have to give me a percentage, but like, what per let's say theoretically, what percentage of those people came to you and they just were having symptoms and they didn't even think about Lyme disease because they didn't have the classical presentation, yeah. they weren't diagnosed acutely, and now they're coming in with this this litany of symptoms. Yeah. What are those symptoms that may be different than somebody who's presenting with the acute? Well, some of the big things I see, uh, I mean, it's various neurological things. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that prompts people to come excuse me, to my office, you know, they've been to their doctor, they've been to their rheumatologist, they've been to their neurologist, you know, they've had litany of tests and nothing came up positive. But I'll hear a lot about, you know, chronic brain fog, just can't think, can't remember, you know, young people that are having, you know, sort of age-related memory issues. Uh, people complain a lot of, you know, neuropathy, so that's numbness and tingling in their hands and their feet. They'll complain that their balance is poor, they feel very clumsy. And uh, I see people who've been very athletic that, can't really do sports anymore. They just yeah. seem like they lack the coordination. I'll see a lot of people with sleep disturbances. You know, I slept great my whole life. All of a sudden, I can't fall asleep. I can't stay asleep. Mm -hmm. Feel very restless in their sleep. Uh, sometimes people have uh, hormone problems that seem to crop up out of nowhere. Low thyroid is actually a very common problem with Lyme disease. Uh, I see people that have, uh, we'll call it sensory distortion. They can feel like... Uh, they'll feel like a burning sensation mm -hmm. in their skin. They say, you know, I feel like I got this second degree sunburn and you look at their skin and it looks perfectly normal. It's something has happened neurologically that they're, they're sensing it, but it's not like 
there. Uh, that and I happens. remember you said that yesterday is like, it's like a cardinal sign. Like there's really nothing else you've seen where people will complain of that sunburn. Yeah, that's a, that sensory distortion. Well, I, I, the, the cardinal sign actually I was referring oh. to was the wandering pain. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Wandering pain. Yeah. Yep. You know, the sensory distortion you'll see in things like MS and okay. other neurological All conditions. Right. But yeah, the telltale sign is what we call wandering pain, where one day it's my left shoulder, the next day it's my right knee, the next day it's my left ankle. And the pain just seems to migrate from one body part to another. As far as I know and I've seen and I've, I've read up on it, I can't find anything else other than Lyme disease that causes that specific symptom. So when I hear people people complain about that. That's the, the big red flag that we need to look at, that Lyme disease. Um, and then I see a lot of people that also just sort of get chronic joint and muscle aches. Okay. And, you know, they've been to the rheumatologist. They've been worked up for autoimmune disease. Everything came back fine. Uh, they, and they've been to the neurologist. Nothing neurological they can find. But I think that inflammation that's being triggered, again, is probably more of an autoimmune reaction to the microbe. It may not fit the definition of, you know, lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, uh, but they feel achy every day. And we tend to see it more in, I'll say, the small joints. So the hands are very common, the wrists are very common, and the feet, even mm -hmm. more than just the knees and the hips. Okay. Uh, so those are probably the more common things I see in chronic Lyme. Okay. So let's get into a little bit of diagnosis, which I think is the place where I feel just from hearing it and learning about this is I feel like this is one of the places where we are really lacking in medicine in the ability to fully tell a patient that they have Lyme disease. Yeah, you know, Lyme disease diagnosis is complex and controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the CDC guidelines of diagnosing Lyme disease is you do what they call a two-tier testing. And the first part of that is that you do what's called a Lyme screen. And this is an antibody test where you're looking at both IgG and IgM antibodies to Lyme. If that test is positive, then the next step is you do what's called a Lyme Western blot. It's basically a more detailed antibody test where you're looking at very specific antibodies that your immune system can make against Lyme. And we know that uh, the biggest problem with this, this methodology is that it's not sensitive. And what that means in, in the lab world, the sensitivity of a test reflects what is the what number of people is it going to pick up that actually have the illness? Mm -hmm. And a good lab test it will have at least more than 95% sensitivity. The sensitivity on the Lyme screen is about 53%. Wow. And as a former lab person, if we were ever going to bring a new test in-house, and if it has sensitivity of 53%, we would never use it. If it's only picking up maybe half of the people, and I, I, there's even some other researches to su suggest it's less than that. So we'll just say half of the people at so best. Why, so why are, is this what we're using? Because this is all we have? With a 53% sensitivity, there's just nothing else? No other test that can be as sensitive to that. Well, understand. You or know, because of the mor morph of morphing of the virus, or I mean, of the bacteria. Like what? Well, understand. You know, the the criteria that's used is really what we've been using for decades. It you know that hasn't changed in you know mm -hmm. forty years of understanding Lyme. So uh, that's always been kind of the gold standard. And again, remember that the, that testing is specifically for people with acute Lyme disease. Right. So for anyone who falls outside of that window, that testing isn't going to be very accurate anyway. So that was always intended to be used as a tool to help evaluate acute Lyme disease. But the diagnosis of Lyme disease is actually what we call a clinical diagnosis. Clinical diagnosis means it's based on your signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. It's not based on a lab test. So it's funny, and I presented yesterday, you know, if you go to the CDC's website and you read about the diagnosis of Lyme, they tell you it is based on your signs and symptoms and if you happen to live in an area where you're exposed to deer ticks, you know, and then you use the lab test really just to confirm your suspicion. So from a practical standpoint, you know, I mean, I always rule out everything else to make sure I'm not missing something. But if you've ruled everything else out, all those tests are negative, you know it's not some other autoimmune disease, and you know you've got some evidence on paper that there's been exposure to Lyme, and they have symptoms of Lyme, you know, you kind of put, you know, two and two together. But uh, So that's where that, that's where 
that's where ruling out the other conditions, especially for somebody who, let's say, lives in the city and never around deer ticks. They come into you with these problems they've been having for maybe six months, a year, two years, and you're like, you wouldn't even think of Lyme disease as the first thing. Now, you might, right? Yeah. But most physicians won't. So that's kind of like, okay, now we need to rule out. And I think this is where people get so lost and confused with this is that if they can't remember a recent exposure or they haven't been in these environments where they were actually exposed to a deer right. tick per se, and they don't know what the vector is, or maybe they did get it sexually, right? This whole theory. Yeah. Then they're they're sent to their first they go to their primary and then their primary sends them to the specialist you know uh, the neurologist and then the neurologist oh well you know I don't know maybe they'll do imaging right they won't always do imaging the neurologist might decide to do an MRI to right. see if it's MS yeah um, and then and then they get sent here and they get there and it's like the 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 litany of sometimes specialists and tests that people have to go through to actually then be told well we can't really find anything wrong with you so maybe it's Lyme disease yeah and the frustration I think that that and then even still the question is that what I have yeah right well you you just said something that just uh, brought up a point I didn't make earlier but I think it's important you know for someone who doesn't necessarily live in the country you know I live in suburban New York City right. you know the concrete jungle right. And I see plenty of people in New York City who get Lyme disease. Well, the deer tick, the name is deceiving. You know, we call it the deer tick because that's where we kind of identified it. And definitely they do attach to deer. But the biggest transmitter of deer ticks are actually rodents. Ah, so mice and rats, rats and raccoons and squirrels and you know, any little furry little thing can carry ticks as well. So the, the deer is actually kind of an, an intermediate host because it's a bigger animal. It can right. get a bigger you know, meal from it. But uh, we know all these little furry creatures can can carry Lyme too, which is why I think again we do see it in areas, you know, Central mm -hmm. Park in New York City. It's you know, there's plenty of uh, you know, mice and rats and rodents and things like that. And that is a way I think that people can get exposed as well. Okay, well that's I yeah. guess good to yeah, have you been to Central Park lately? <laughs> <laughs> Were you picnicking with rats? <laughs> but uh yeah, I guess I guess I didn't think about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so I guess kind of back to that diagnosis. So now we've ruled out the other things. Yeah. And let's say their um, Lyme testing comes back kind of inconclusive. Um, what do you then, what's your next yeah. stage of attack? Well, I'll, I'll just share because I think it's pertinent to this topic. You know, when I first had Lyme disease, again, I had classic Lyme disease. I knew I had it. I had every symptom. And when I did my own Lyme test, my Lyme screen was negative, but my Lyme Western blot lit up like a Christmas tree. So, so why don't they go straight to the Western blot? That's my other question. Why are they doing that for the first ELISA test? Why don't they just go straight to the Western blot? They will argue that there can be false positives on the Western blot. So... The ELISA is more s sensitive? No. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it log really, logically, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. It's kind of like a, we have a friend whose wife had cancer. Yeah. But they did all these other tests on her, and she kept saying, and they, oh, we don't know what it is. We don't know what it is. But then they go do the full body scan. You know, there's the, the test. I forget. Right. It's leaving my mind right now. And it just showed she had cancer. And her yeah. husband was like why don't you just do this first? Why do we have to spend six months going through all these tests yeah. when we could have just done this test on our first and seen this? We knew there was something there. So I guess that's my question is like, well, what's the sensitivity? Why don't we just go straight to that yeah, Western I, I think, you know, again, as a former lab tech who ran this test, I think it's a horrible test. And personally, I don't run it. I never run it. I don't find it valuable. So I go straight to the Western blot. Okay. And uh, So as a clinician, you have the option to do that. Yeah. You, you don't okay. necessarily have to do it. I mean, I think most conventionally trained doctors, because that's what they've been taught, that's the way that they do it. A lot of the labs, when you do the order, it you, know, you order the Lyme screen, and if it's positive, it automatically flexes to the Lyme Western blot. But I, I know better, so I just go straight to the Western blot. Okay. And, you know... People also need to understand that depending on what lab you use makes a difference too. And again, this is where sort of we get into the controversial part of the testing because even with the Western blot, you know, a lot of the tests that uh, conventional big reference labs like Quest and LabCorp are using, the way that they're reporting it, they follow the CDC recommendations on on what's being tested. There are other labs out there that we use that offer more comprehensive reporting. The test itself is 
kind of the same. The difference really often is in what they're reporting. And there are, there are more technical details I really won't get into, but uh, the, the, some of the Lyme specialty labs, the test kit they use is a little bit different and probably more sensitive. So that's another reason to use a Lyme specialty lab when you're doing your Lyme testing. But what I like about the lab that I use is they actually send me a copy of the patient's test strip. I can actually look at it myself mm. and because I've done this test before, I know what I'm looking for. And, uh, you know, one of the things that the way that the CDC has dictated how to interpret the test is, you know, when they do your test, they compare you to a control. And so for you to have a positive test, you have to have certain antibodies that they've already decided that this is what Lyme patients have. And what this really came from is back in the day, they just drew blood from people who had Lyme disease, looked to see what antibodies were there, and they said, okay, well, if you have Lyme disease, this is what you, you, you have. We've now learned in you know 40 years that some of these antibodies are very specific to Lyme, some of them are not specific to Lyme. And why they've never changed it to only look at the Lyme-specific bands and not the non-specific ones, I'm not really sure, but uh, so in my world, you know, we're really honing in on looking at those Lyme specific bands, but to call it positive, uh, and maybe this is too technical, but uh, this is what creates a lot of the, the, the confusion is that you have to be 60% of the control. Uh, so 60% of the intensity of the control. So the assumption is, is that when you have Lyme disease, and remember, they're thinking about acute Lyme disease, is that you make a ton of antibody. Your immune system has this huge reaction, says, wow, I've got this foreign body here, it doesn't need to be here, and you have this huge immune response. Well, you know, we're all different people, and as you can imagine, not everyone's immune response is the same. Right. And what if you're someone who has a, a, a genetic uh, or acquired immune deficiency? You know, then antibody tests are really not helpful at all. So there's a lot of individual variations that I don't think they've ever really accounted for. Uh, but, you know, what happens is if it's not that 60% threshold, what if it's 58%? What if it's 59%? So I get these lab reports back and I'll see the test is flagged as negative. But when I actually look at it, you know, they have the right antibodies, the Lyme specific antibodies, but yeah, it's 57%, 58%. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, really? One or 2%? That's the difference between whether you do or do not have Lyme. I mean, you can just imagine logically, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Right. So in, in my mind, you know, if you've got a Lyme specific band, and it's there, you know, it's kind of like being a little pregnant. I mean, you are, you are. So <laughs> right. if it's there, the amount probably really doesn't matter that much. So I think, you know, you have to be clear about what, I mean, me as the clinician, what you're looking for uh, on these different, you know, Lyme antibodies. All right. Well, it's, yeah, I think the diagnosis is very confusing. Uh, and if you're not used to looking at it, especially like if somebody came to me, you know, and said, oh, I want to be tested for Lyme disease. And, oh, okay, I'll do that for you and I'll test you. I really don't look at Lyme disease enough. I don't look at these parameters enough to understand that or to know that. And so I may be like, oh, you're fine. You don't have Lyme disease, right? Right. So maybe lots of people are falling through the cracks only because their practitioners just don't have enough experience with either interpreting the test or they're interpreting it just as the lab says it is. They don't understand how to look at the test and read that. Right. And so then, oh, no, you don't have Lyme. And then kind of on to the next thing. Well, and that's typically what happens with patients is they went to their primary care doctor they got the standard Lyme test through their primary doctor and it comes back, you know, maybe there's one or two uh, antibodies that come up, but it, it doesn't meet the criteria to call it a positive test. So their doctor just says, yep, this is a negative test and, you know, let's move on to something else. Right. But again, I think that's just sort of a, a, a misunderstanding of what the test means. You know, converse to that though, you know, if you do get bit by a tick and it does transmit Lyme and your immune system does what you want it to do, you know, your body could eradicate the infection before you really became symptomatic. But if I test you, you're going to have antibodies there. So uh -huh. I could test a bunch of people that might have antibodies who never had Lyme disease because they never got to that point. So this is why we can't put all of our, you know, eggs in one basket with the test too to say every time someone has antibodies, they have Lyme. Right. Because that's not it's true that either. clinical presentation you're looking for. I did get a question. Can somebody be immune to it. Like this one guy said, you know, I've been out, been covered with ticks. I've been bit. I've never shown yeah. any. And so he's like, could I be immune to getting it? And maybe it's the case of you may have it. You may have developed antibodies and your immune system fought it. And so just like any of these other maybe viral infections we have yeah. with kids like, like chicken pox and whatever, 
they still show up in our blood, but our our body fought it off. So that's why we have the antibodies. Yeah, I don't think that we're immune to Lyme in the way you think of, you know, uh, you know, once you get, you know, chicken pox or something like right. that, that you're, you know, you get lifelong immunity. Not in that way, but I think someone certainly could have a very uh, well-oiled immune system that when they do get exposed... It kicks into action very quickly, probably to the point where they don't even get symptoms. I think that's very possible. But what's interesting is that you know, if you get bit by a tick, you get Lyme disease, that does not make you immune to getting it in the future. Okay, yeah. And because that's mainly a bacteria too. So you're, you're creating antibodies towards that bacteria. Your body's right. fighting it off. And then if you're getting exposed in the future. Right. But I've seen patients, you know, who had Lyme disease, they went years of being symptom free, mm. got Lyme disease again. Okay. So uh, it does certainly doesn't provide any kind of lifelong immunity. Like once you get it once, that's it. Uh, there is always the possibility of getting reinfected. So then that brings in kind of the, the other side of the coin. If you get Lyme disease, do you have it forever? No. You can treat it and it can be gone or you'll do, uh, maybe your antibodies will show up for it, but you're not. Well, we know that once you get exposed to Lyme and even if you've been treated appropriately, it, those antibodies can stay elevated for 20 years. Okay. So we can't use the antibodies as a reliable marker on how well you're doing. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, Getting exposed that first time, you know, is a sensitizing event. Um, I think the longer-term concern is, again, the possibility of it triggering really the autoimmune issue. And that's really what's kind of leading, I think, more to these chronic Lyme issues. Again, I, I see plenty of people who get Lyme, get treated, all their symptoms go away, and that's the end of that. We don't really see a problem again. So I think now we're getting into a lot of individual variations on everything else that keeps your immune system primed, your lifestyle, your sleep pattern, your diet. Let's talk a little bit about treatments. First, I want to talk about the conventional treatments. What What is somebody who has an acute case, they've come in, they're now going to be treated. What, what would they be looking at in a, in a conventional uh, physic? Yeah, conventional so, model, what would uh, they be looking at? The conventional treatment uh, for acute Lyme disease is uh, either using doxycycline or amoxicillin. Uh, typically okay. for adults, it's doxycycline. Uh, and you use it up to the typical dose is uh, 21 days. Uh, what I find very interesting is you know, the, the CDC recommendation is 21 days of doxycycline. And whether you're well or not at the end of that time period, you're just done. That's just oh. the guideline. Yeah. Uh, I think there have been other doctors, even in the conventional world, that have kind of extended that a little bit longer. So some doctors I see now will extend it to four weeks or even six weeks. Uh, but, that, but that's the conventional model. For people that have known Lyme in the brain, they call it neuroborreliosis. So this is usually done if they do a spinal tap on you and they identify Lyme in your spinal fluid, then the recommendation is to give you IV antibiotics. Okay. So the, that's sort of the, the standard guideline. Uh, and even for pregnant women, you know, there is a recommendation for antibiotics. But again, they kind of cap it off at that three weeks and you know, when you're done, you're done. Can you explain the bit of a difference between the different types of antibiotics they use and what they're doing? Yeah. So, you know, antibiotics are really broken down into two types of categories. There's one that are called bacterial cytal, which means that these antibiotics directly kill the bug. And the other ones are called bacteriostatic. So they don't kill the bug. What they do is they stop the bug from replicating. And so the concept in those type of drugs is that, you know, it holds it at bay and it gives your immune system the chance to go in there and get rid of it. So amoxicillin is a bacterial cytal. It actually it breaks up the cell wall of the bacteria so it, 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 it kills it directly. Where doxycycline, the more common drug, is a bacteria static. Again, it just keeps the organism from replicating. The challenge in this is that Lyme is a very slow-growing organism. So any antibiotic that's geared at affecting its replication is only going to work when the organism's in its replication cycle. You know, most bacteria replicate every 20 minutes. Lyme can replicate up to every 16 days. So wow. it's very, very slow. And I think that's why we argue that the course of treatment really needs to be much longer because it is such a slow-growing organism. Wow. Okay. So <clears throat> now they've gotten this round of antibiotics and then they're done and they're treated. Uh, what if they're not, what if they're still having symptoms? Do they now go into chronic Lyme? Well, what, not, would the treat, what would the treatments, what would a conventional treatment be for chronic Lyme? 
Well, uh, from a conventional standpoint, there is no treatment. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you go to the CDC's website and if you read what they call now called post Lyme syndrome, it's basically symptomatic support, but they don't recommend antibiotics. Uh, now, there's a group out there called ILADS, the International mm -hmm. Lyme and Associated yeah. Disease Society, that feels very differently. And these doctors will use antibiotics long term in people who have chronic Lyme or persistent Lyme. So that's where we kind of deviate from the Infectious Disease Society of America. This is the conventional infectious disease doctors that uh, really don't believe in using antibiotics long term like that. Uh, I would argue, uh, I'm probably more along that line as well, that my experience for most patients with chronic Lyme is that they might do well on antibiotics temporarily, but when they come off the antibiotics, they often regress and relapse fairly quickly. And my concern with the long-term antibiotics is what it's doing to your own gut flora, mm -hmm. your own microbiome, all of these healthy bacteria we need to function well. You know, you can't kill the bad stuff without killing the good stuff. And mm -hmm. as much as we try to support with probiotics and things like that, uh, we're always going to kill off more than we can replenish. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can become a bit of a, a problem. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of other alternatives out there to the antibiotics. Uh, but from a conventional standpoint, the antibiotics are really only for acute Lyme and uh, are pretty much ignored for chronic Lyme. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening to the Hunt Harvest Health podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Visit our website at huntharvesthealth.com for more podcast stories and recipes. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Hunt Harvest Health. You can also message me at Stahealthy Hunter, that's S-T-H, and I will be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Also tag your photos, Hunt Harvest Health, or Get Stealthy, as we enjoy seeing what you guys are doing as well.